join internationally acclaimed overland expert Paul Marsh and award-winning journalist Gregory Simpson as they delve into all things responsible overlanding. From choosing the right vehicle, getting yourself prepared, getting your vehicle prepared, safety tips and much, much more. Only on responsible overlanding. Have you ever seen a, a, a defender owner without grubby hands? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I, the poor guys, they get, they get so much taken out of them, you know, but, but when you see someone, I, I had a lovely couple and they'd driven down from Saudi all the way down through Africa and they got here and they'd had their challenges and the car was a great vehicle and very well prepared. And, um, you know, he just looked and, and he, his passion and his excitement and he's got his vehicle here and you can talk about the problems and you get through them. And some of the best experiences I've had when we've taken groups of, of vehicles, you know, on, on through cross countries in workshops when the people who you're working together mm. with the mechanics. And that can be the most memorable part Absolutely. of the whole trip. And, you, you know, you're having fun and the guy's fixing your car and it's, it's maybe an interaction you wouldn't have maybe had, you know, so... It's a different experience, yeah. It's a beautiful world out there. Sometimes if you watch too much TV, you just get bombarded with what's wrong, but there's a lot of good stuff going on out there. There's a lot, a lot no, of good I think, I think that, that for me is, it's like, you know, a radio channel, is a Smile FM? Only positive news? Yeah, I think that's right. Anyway, I stop listening to the news. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I don't listen to the news, but that said, I mean, I do like the, the positive output people exactly. have, you know. We can all Smile be negative. FM, that's a good name for radio stations. Yeah, we all good. could do a lot more Smile So news. it's just, it's just about being positive. You know, we can always look at the worst. Half, half, what does it say? Cup half empty or yeah. cup half full? You choose. Or the cup overflow. And Jason Jones says, very wise advice. Listen, observe, and implement what Paul is saying. Man, that's very kind. <laughs> um, hard learned lessons, hey? I think, you know, make, make no mistake, I've, I've paid my price, I've made some big mistakes over the years. In lucky to be even here. sitting here. Yeah, yeah, and you know, lucky to be sitting here because I had a you know, fatal car accident driving a four-wheel drive in South America. You know, flipped the car, rolled it six times and broke my neck. And I'm sitting here today because the doctor next to me wasn't injured, Sat satellite phone worked, and one of the top neck surgeons in South America put me back together. So, you know, so with that hindsight experience, I look at life very differently. And I'm sure your driving style has changed now. No, it's well, actually really you, interesting. You were tired at that stage, weren't uh, you? Yeah, so, so, you know, when I went back on what caused that accident, we'd been on the road for three months and we had massive responsibility, huge number of vehicles on the rally. And of course, too fast, too tired, massively too tired, totally exhausted, you know, and taking risks beyond our capabilities because we were that tired. So again, when you unpack what went wrong, you could see the mistakes. So I'm, I'm really vehement when I, when I train people about safety, is because that is my highest priority. And if it's not yours, then please don't work with me, because I'm, I'm not interested. Exactly. It's, it's that important to me, because I've nearly paid the price. So, you know, people get it, people get it. And for sure, um, people want to learn, and they, they want, they, I don't want people to make those mistakes. So yeah, absolutely. Christopher Saki says, always, an icon, keep it up, legend. There you go, more, oh, more love for much. Mr. Paul Marsh. <laughs> and best engine for overlanding in a 105, Mark Winter says, thanks for the ideas. Just by the way, the engine concern was not the 1H, it's the 1H. HDT. Yeah. And you so know can you clear that up? <laughs> <laughs> we were standing filming and I, I wasn't concentrating and I have to own it. And uh, he's absolutely correct. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's not the 1H then. So, we actually going to do so it. Even the best make mistakes. We all make sometimes. mistakes, and thank you for the correction. Um, so we're going to film you, and I'm going to film the different engines and all the different cruises. I think it's going to be quite nice for yeah. people to see, and we can probably talk about you know the weaknesses and the pluses and minuses. And we'll find some really old vehicles that we've got uh, floating around the workshops. But so basically, you know, the one H Z is it's got a name that people call it the Hill Finder. And I, I nearly rolled off my chair when someone said to me, he says, oh, it's a hill finder. I was like, what do you mean a hill finder? He says, man, it goes so slowly. You've got to look for the hills out there. <laughs> so it's the first time I'd heard that. But the 1HZ six-cylinder is like the workhorse donkey of language. Is that the most reliable diesel engine in the world? 
oh, you know, I couldn't say in the world. You know, I, I, I don't Top have three. experience. You know, at the end of the day, in, in the four-wheel drive industry, it has definitely been a motor that has stood around for a long time. So if you're looking at how good a, a motor is, you've got to look at how long has it been in the market. You know, so the earlier motors were all good motors, but the 1.8 set has sort of stood the test of time. So the fact that we can still buy them now um, for new vehicles, you know, with some of the vehicles, well, all the vehicles we try and order for our Safari companies that we build fleets for, they all want the 1.8 sets, you know. Because it's a, it's a slower vehicle, so it's, it's probably less, people aren't going to speed as much. Exactly. So. The, the motor that we were talking about, so most of the vehicles came out, the 105s came out with that six cylinder 4.2 diesel. And uh, then, then you got the 12 valve, which was, and then you got the 24 valve, okay, which came out with the turbo. So we, first of all, let's go back. You got the 12 valve 1HZ six cylinder, beautiful motor. And then they added a turbo on it and they called it the 1HDT. And I, I personally like that, that motor. Um, and it's just a beautiful, strong motor. And then you've got the 24 valve version of that one. And, more uh, power, more fuel economy? It's got more power. Um, it's got a different torque curve, and I'd have to compare them more technically. Um, there's definitely, it's a more complex motor, you know, in a sense. Uh, so, you know, you're gonna find that it's got a little bit more electronics on it. Um, I like the motor. It's it's got it definitely has more power on it. But I, I do I must say personally for me the the, the earlier one HDT um, with the turbo the four point two with the turbo turbo replacement. How often are you finding you have to replace turbos on cruises? You know you would if you were going to rebuild your engine then you 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 refurbish the turbo. You know turbo shouldn't need to be replaced if you're looking after the motor properly. Turbos really get replaced when people don't look after the motors. And I think that's the challenge. It's like changing, if you don't change oil often enough, and you know, there's a small oil feed that goes through to the turbo. So if your turbo doesn't get oil, it's gonna have premature wear. So it's like anything in the engine. If, if, if good oil lubrication get, get around and you're changing your filters often, then you're gonna find parts wear less. And I've seen engines where they've done high mileage and the turbos are still good. They may be a bit worn, but they're still good. But if I'm gonna rebuild an engine, we will absolutely recondition the turbo. So, you, so if somebody can get a track from you, a truck for a lifetime. Look, I mean, what we're doing with the older vehicles, we're taking, we're taking the older trucks and it does cost money to, to refurbish these trucks. It's not a cheap process to, to rebuild and refurbish an old truck. What you are getting is you're getting a simple truck that's got long life and there's no reason why you can't build back in to that truck another lifetime of, of use, you know, where you can actually use this truck to drive many, many thousands of kilometers. No reason. Isn't it great seeing these old trucks back on the road, back in the bush? Mm. Oh, look, it's, you know, I love the older, the older uh, vehicles, you know, even the older 40 series, the 45s, I mean, Oof. they're beautiful. Like Ruthie's really one in Australia. Oh, it's, <laughs> it's gorgeous. <laughs> um, so it's, it's absolutely spectacular, I think, uh, to see those old ones. But, you know, things, times have moved on, and of course you're looking at comfort, and people are looking at safety, and, you know, so the balance was... We've, we've come to a, a nice compromise now where we are now where we're saying, you know, we can still get these engines, we can still get these vehicles. And that's what, in our time now, we're building these vehicles on. Million dollar question, how much longer are they going to still make the 79 for? Look, the 79, I think as long as it's got demand, you know, and it certainly is a vehicle that's got a very high demand. I don't know the figures on what the sales figures are, but certainly it's, it's a very attractive vehicle because you've now got a vehicle that you can actually put a family in with enough space to carry. And, and you actually could do with more space. I mean, I guess there's, there's a calling for a vehicle that for, for our, our niche, our overland niche, where you could have a vehicle that's got more load carrying capacity to really comfortably transport and sleep four people, you know. And at the moment, you know, it's very difficult to put four people living in one camper unit yeah. without it being pretty squashed up and, and, and you know, it, you could do it for seven seats of double cab. <laughs> <laughs> You're dreaming. <laughs> I'm dreaming. Defender, Defender Mods and Travel again with more, more comments. Agree with almost everything said. Well, that's something positive for a channel. <laughs> the channel is very different. It's more about the philosophy of overlanding travel rather than nuts and bolts. And not too much focus on equipment brands. 
Although it is noted that all of the vehicles are Toyotas. Bear in mind this is a <laughs> Defender 90 owner. <laughs> I think we you know if, if we were filming this in England, we'd have a lot more Land Rovers because we built a lot more. I do build Land Rovers and I do get them out for people. And currently we've got three on the go, you know, but certainly the market. As you do have three Landys on the go at yeah, the moment. I do, yeah. Okay, so it's not a small part of your business then? No, no, not at all. I mean, I think, you know, predominantly people will go for Land Cruisers because they've got a reputation for the reliability. We can find them and source them easier. You can find Land Rovers here. But I'll be honest, you know, I would rather build a Land Cruiser than a newer um, Land Rover Puma, let's say, because I've had experience where we had a whole fleet of them for one of the companies that... That's when you see when things yeah. go wrong. And things, well, they did. They had a lot of things, but that did go wrong. Uh, and, you know, when, when, when you're an enthusiast, it's fantastic. But of course, when people are hiring vehicles, they don't want things to go wrong. So, you know, the, and of course, the, the footprint for Toyota is massive as far as support goes. So it's, it's, it's my preference. It doesn't make it... I love driving the Land Rovers. I mean, I drove a Disco mm. pretty much around the world. At Disco uh, One, your impressions of that vehicle? So I, I've, I own the 300 TDI, 300 TDI Disco um, Discovery, 300 TDI. Is that the 2.5 turbo diesel? Yeah. You've got the 200 TDI and then you've got the 300 TDI engine. And the 4 litre and, gas uh, goes low. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were nice to drive. Um, and I love my truck. I know I really did. I, I, I spent many, many um, kilometers driving around the world with, the, with that truck on many expeditions. I put a roll cage in it. Um, it it was beautiful, and when I, mean, I sold it, I, I think it did another two trips through Africa, maybe even more clients. It was originally a Dutch vehicle, and I bought it from for a couple um, who did a trip, a big trip, and then at the end of it, I bought it off them, and then I continued using it for my myself. So, you know, it, it, it served me very well, and I really enjoyed it, and I've owned a 90, and I've had, had a 110, and so, you know, it's, it's, it was definitely in England... I loved having that brand and we were very much, you know, we specialized in Land Rover and Land Cruiser. Now, triple nine, Mr. Khaled, you're going to love this one. I think that Toyota should make a 70 series and call it Paul Marsh. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think a lot more people deserve that honor. Um, yeah, look, the Land, it's, it would be, it would be my dream to actually take a vehicle and build it into a, an overland vehicle that people can literally buy off the shelf. Standardize. Yeah, standardized. And wouldn't this be the best time to uh, buy those vehicles? Well, look, I mean, if you if you, were going to do it, if you were going to do it, this is the time. You know, if, if you came and said, okay, well, let's build a fleet of vehicles that people can buy that is a standardized, what mm. really works. But I think half the fun is also, you know, when you dream of your vehicle, you dream of personalizing it. Half the journey that we yeah. all experience is doing the research and discussing what you want in your truck. And that's where it becomes very different for people, you know. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you can't take away as much as you could buy something off the shelf, which we get. We get a very good Toyota yeah. Land Cruiser off the shelf, which is very capable. And you? the 200, yeah. your, your impressions of that? Which I don't see you kitting too many of those out. You know, I don't. Um, we do a, a few of them, okay. But personally, for big overland expedition trips, it's a very capable vehicle. You know, it really is, and and it's it's. I've got friends in Australia, and they drive theirs, and it's fantastic. They love it. Um, but I think space-wise, again, you know, I've had people who've owned two hundreds, and they've come away, and they've gone. You know, I'm just looking for a bit more space. It doesn't make it a bad vehicle or a bad choice. You can absolutely make that vehicle into a lovely overland vehicle. It just depends on what your needs and are. Where you go. And where you're going. And if you're going for the longer you go, you probably want more space to store stuff. And yeah, so it's, you know. Courses for courses. Mm.